Hey everyone, good morning. Uh, thanks for coming so early. So my name is Josh Gordon. And I'm Lawrence Moroni. And we're here today to speak with you about TensorFlow's high-level APIs. And I have a lot of good news for you, and I hope this talk will be concrete and useful. So one area I'm particularly passionate about is making machine learning as accessible as possible to as many people as possible. And uh, the TensorFlow team has been investing very heavily in the same thing. So we spent a lot of energy uh, making TensorFlow easier to use. And um, I'd like to show you basically a demo of it, what is, in my opinion, the very easiest way to get started with TensorFlow today. So there's uh, three things that are concrete that I'd like to uh, walk you through. And the very first is um, even if you're brand new to TensorFlow, you're brand new to machine learning, even if you're new to Python, uh, one area that seems silly but is non-trivial for a lot of people is actually just installing TensorFlow in different dependencies. And I know for Python developers, it's just pip install TensorFlow, but that can be hard for people that are brand new. So I'm going to show you something called Colab, and I'll walk you through Colab. It's basically a Jupyter Notebook server running in the cloud. It's free of charge. It has TensorFlow pre-installed, comes with a free GPU. It's awesome. I'll walk you through how to use that, how to get started with TensorFlow. The next thing, um, TensorFlow has many different APIs. But my personal favorite, and what I'd strongly, strongly recommend to you, is something called Keras. And Keras, uh, the Keras API is completely implemented inside of TensorFlow. Uh, it's great. I can't tell you uh, how much fun I've had uh, using it. So I'll walk you through writing Hello World in Keras. The same API is also useful for TensorFlow.js. And then I'm going to point you to some educational resources uh, to learn more. Cool. Uh, so these are the APIs that I want to briefly introduce. So Keras, it's basically Lego-like building blocks for building and defining models. TF.data, so when a lot of people start learning ML, they get really hung up on, OK, they learn that a neural network is uh, composed of layers, and they find out that they can adjust the number of neurons per layer, and there's different hyperparameters like the optimizer and stuff like that. And they spend a lot of time on what I call modeling. But something that's really, really important but doesn't get enough attention is actually how do you get your data into the network? And writing input pipelines is, is non-trivial. So I'm also going to show you an API called TFData, which is a relatively easy to use, but also a very high performance way of writing your input pipelines. And then I'm going to show you Eager execution. If you're new to test, and Lawrence is going to give you a lot more depth on Eager. Yep. By the way, when you hear the word Eager execution, if you're new to TensorFlow, just ignore that and just think of this as this is the thing you always do. So you should always write and run, so develop and debug your TensorFlow programs eagerly. And it makes TensorFlow feel just like regular Python. Uh, this is a short talk, so I'm not going to go into all the details of how TensorFlow works under the hood, but this is the right way to do it if you're learning TensorFlow today. Uh, so briefly, this is what I would do if you want to try uh, TensorFlow and Keras and TF data and uh, eager execution in the fastest possible way. And I should tell you uh, off the bat, so all these APIs, they're fully implemented, and they're working well. We are just now... Uh, starting to write all the samples and docs around them. So I have a feeling the samples I was able to cook up for this talk are they're quite rough. Um, but uh, stay tuned and check back in the next few months as we flesh this out. But let me just show you uh, how to dive right in. So if you go to this website, it will bring you, oh, can we switch to the laptop for a minute, please? Thank you. It will bring you to this GitHub site. Mm -hmm. And if you scroll down to the readme, you'll see a sequence of a few notebooks. And I just want to show you how easy it is to get started. If you just click on one, what happens is they open up immediately in Colab. And so now you have a Jupyter Notebook. It's running entirely in the cloud. You can hit Connect to connect to a kernel. And now I can start running these cells. And I'll walk you through this in more detail in a few minutes. But if you go through the first notebook, this is going to show you how to write your first neural network using Keras. Um, there's a little bit of pre-processing code, but the notebook is very short. The next notebook will show you how to do the same thing using uh, Keras in combination with TF data and eager execution. And then we go into a little bit more depth. So it's literally that easy to get started. Um, it will take you about five minutes end to end to try this out. All right, so let's, let's switch back to the slides, please. And let me give you a little bit more depth of what's happening in these notebooks. So uh, using the Keras API, this is the complete code uh, minus a few lines of preprocessing, just formatting the data to uh, write, train, evaluate, and make predictions uh, with your first neural network in TensorFlow. 
So if you were using TensorFlow um, about a year ago, it would have been substantially more code. <laughs> And there's other great high-level APIs, including estimators, which are really, really wonderful for doing uh, machine learning in production. But at least for learning ML, um, I'd strongly recommend this. So I will walk you through exactly what all of these lines are doing. And one point I want to make is that the code is it's concept heavy, but code light. So writing the code itself should no longer be a barrier uh, to getting started with ML. I hope that far fewer people are going to uh, spend energy and time on the syntax and debugging. And now you can spend more of your time and energy thinking about what you're trying to do and why. Oh, yeah. And before I dive into code, I want to make a really, really important point. So machine learning is a broad field. By far, a, another mistake that a lot of students make when they're learning is they learn how to train an image classifier, like we're going to do in a moment. And they find out when they write the classifier, they start evaluating it. And they see these numbers like 99% accuracy. And then they find out that by tweaking the network, you can get to like 99.6 or whatever. And in reality, it almost never matters. The most important thing you can spend your time on is designing the experiment. And what I mean by that is concretely thinking about what are you trying to predict and why? How will it be used in practice? What could go wrong? Where does the data come from? Thinking through the design of your system as you would in any type of software is much, much more important than messing around trying to get higher accuracy. Um, I'm not going to cover this today. There's a whole talk on that. But today, I just want to show you the code. But always think about what and why in addition to how. All right, so before I dive into this, a couple cool things. Not enough time to introduce TensorFlow. I just wanted to call out the community is the most important thing about TensorFlow. Um, in addition to the 1,000-plus folks who have contributed code, there are many, many more who are doing things like teaching, organizing events, um, writing articles. And these things are incredibly valuable, too. And there's a few new things that I just wanted to call out. This came out uh, two days ago. So there's another library called TensorFlow.js, part of TensorFlow in JavaScript. It uses the same APIs, uh, the Keras API that I'm going to show you today. Weren't you going to act out this slide? I was going to act this out. I'll there's a great sandbox where you can try it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could dance it out. Anyway, it basically, it's TensorFlow running in the browser. And this runs in real time. There's two links on the bottom if you check this out at home. There's a really great demo you can play with on our blog. And you can actually find the code on the website. Um, another thing, there's uh, a pair of links here which I'd really encourage you to try. So this is Magenta, and Magenta is a project that uses TensorFlow for uh, experiments in art and music. And here, this is computer-assisted drawing. So Magenta is helping me draw a duck. So I'm drawing the duck with the mouse in Magenta. It's sort of like autocomplete for drawing. There's a great game called Quick Draw, which I'd encourage you to try. It's great for kids. It's, yeah, uh, Quick Draw, and the Magenta demo is great to try. Just some fun stuff before we get in the code. And also, before I get in the code, in a personal note, one of the reasons I care about uh, machine learning so much is uh, because of a project called Cellbot. And Cellbot is a project from 2004. It was in a biology lab. And Cellbot uses a neural network uh, to identify specific types of cells in solution and then sort them. And what was so cool to me as a student uh, working on this mm -hmm. is that machine learning is not just for computer scientists. The fact that biologists were trying to do something useful um, using technology that originated in our field was really meaningful to me. It's how can we use machine learning for medicine, for art, for healthcare, just to do useful things in the world. So uh, that's, that's kind of the thinking behind everything I do with ML. It's what can we do to help people, basically. All right, so Colab. Uh, the URL for Colab is colab.research.google.com. Colab is short for collaboratory. It's inspired a lot by Google Docs. It's a Google Docs style uh, code editor, and you can download. Basically, you can uh, save Jupyter Notebooks in Google Drive. You can download them back as regular Jupyter Notebooks, so there's no lock-in. I know a lot of people, by the way, are not from Python. So I just want to spend a minute and introduce uh, Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, so broadly, here's Colab, and there's two types of cells. There's markdown cells, which contain markdown. And if you edit a markdown cell, like I'm doing with Hello World, and you execute it, it just renders the markdown. The other type of cell is a code cell. And if you edit the code and execute the cell, it executes the code. That's all it is. And there's one really cool thing as well is that they give you access to GPUs. Yes. I've spoken with a lot of people who either find it very difficult to set up their GPUs, or you know, maybe they're in a university environment and they don't have access to expensive GPUs. And if you're using a Colab, you can actually connect it to a, a GPU in our data center so that you can test out your code running on GPUs. Exactly. With no Super install cool. at all. Yep. It's a really good point. 
The other thing you can do if you're new to Jupyter Notebooks is you can uh, create visualizations in line. So here I'm using matplotlib to plot some data, and the graph goes right in line with your notebook. And this is really important because it's a great way to share results. Another thing that I wanted to mention quickly is you can pip install libraries. So you're basically you're running in some containers sitting somewhere on GCP, but you can install whatever libraries you need. So here I'm pip installing uh, matplotlib, so you have root access to it. And then the last thing, a lot of people miss this feature, but it's super useful. It's called snippets, and it's, it's conveniently hidden in the table of contents. But what I'm doing in this notebook is I'm going to create some data, and then I'm going to download the data off of Colab back to my laptop. And to find out how to do that, I click on this snippets thing, and I start searching for downloading data. And Colab, can't totally see it on the screen, has a snippet of code that I can just copy and paste directly into the notebook and run. So uh, it has examples of how to install libraries and everything like that. It's super useful. Don't have time to talk about this. Colab is great for reproducible examples. All right. So let me jump right into uh, what it looks like to use Keras um, to write your first neural network. And I talked about this earlier, but um, no one has ever looked at the code to write your first neural network, regardless of how smart you are. It doesn't matter if you have like a PhD in physics or whatever, and it's just gone, oh, I get it. It's impossible. It takes months to learn this stuff. Um, so it's completely normal to see lots of concepts and have no idea what they mean. But let me just at least introduce you, and then I'll point you to a course you can use to get more depth. Oh, the other thing, I should probably look at my slides, right? So you'll see lots of parameters when you define these networks, and really only one or two are important to spend your time on. And I'll, I'll point you at what those are as we go. So there's broadly five steps um, to write Hello World in TensorFlow using Keras. Um, the good news is steps three, four, and five are literally one line of code. Um, so that's, that's all the work of training the network, evaluating your accuracy, and making predictions. Collecting the data set in reality takes a long time. Pre-processing the data takes a long time. It's just getting it to the right shape. And building your model um, is where a lot of the concepts are. So let's see what this looks like. So we're going to use MNIST. I know for people that are machine learning experts, you know MNIST cold. And um, the reason I picked it is just so we don't have to worry too much about the data. If you're new to MNIST, it's, uh, it's sort of the hello world of computer vision. Um, it's a data set of about uh, 60,000 plus, very low resolution handwritten digits. And our goal is to train an image classifier to classify or recognize digits that it hasn't seen before. So here's what we'll do. We'll import TensorFlow. And you can see that. Uh, on the second line, we're importing MNIST. And this is easy because the data set is already, we have a loader for it that's baked into uh, TensorFlow. And if you're new to using Keras with TensorFlow, you can see that it's just included. You can do tf.keras, and now you have access to the complete Keras API. So there's nothing else to do. It's just, it's just there. And this is awesome. By the way, there are many, many awesome advanced things you can do using Keras and TensorFlow. Like, it's great. Here, I'm just trying to show you the straight, easiest possible way. Uh, here's the format of the data set. So as imported, it's divided already for us into train and test. Train is about 60,000. Test is 10,000. The top right, I have a diagram of the format of the images. If you look at the notebooks on that workshop directory, the best thing you can do when you import a data set is to spend a lot of time asking really basic questions. So literally, when you import the data, print it out. Print out the shape. Print out a single image. Look at the format. What's the data type? Is it floating point? Is it an integer? What are the dimensions? How many do I have? Spending a lot of time just understanding the format, the plumbing, will save you a lot of headache uh, later on. So it's always OK to ask really basic questions. In the bottom right, um, there's many neural networks that work with 2D images. Here we're going to make a simplification, and we're just going to unroll the thing. So instead of a 2D image, we're literally going to unstack the rows. These images happen to be 28 by 28 pixels. When we unstack them, we get a vector that's 28 times 28 equals 780-something uh, pixels in a line. So it's a simplification. That's all it is to import the data set. I didn't show the code, which is just NumPy, to reshape it, but it's in the notebook. So now we're going to build our model. And here's concepts that will be probably entirely meaningless to you um, if you're brand new to ML. One funny thing about neural networks, so there's many different types of classifiers. And most of my background, uh, I was really invested in tree-based models before deep learning was a thing. And the reason I like tree-based models, like random forests, is that I can look at a tree, and intuitively, my brain understands exactly what the tree is doing to classify the data. Like, I get it. It clicks. Neural networks can be a little bit counterintuitive. Um, it's hard to describe in 30 seconds. But let me just tell you what we're doing, and you can take the course to learn more. So here we're defining a fully connected deep neural network. Uh, there's going to be two layers that you can see. So first, we're saying, 
we're defining our model. We're saying we're going to use the sequential API, which is the simplest API to define your model. It literally means our model is going to be a stack of layers. The first layer that we're stacking on is going to be a dense layer. Dense means it's fully connected. Um, and I'll show you a diagram of this. Um, oh, I'm sorry. There's just, this is a one layer network. But uh, the notebooks have an exercise where you can add a second layer. Um, and then we're adding an output layer with 10 outputs. And each of those outputs is basically going to gather evidence that the image that we feed through this network corresponds to uh, each of the digits. And this slide, I was editing these slides last night, so this slide is actually a little bit different. Um, but here we actually do have two dense layers. The point that I want to uh, mention, there's a couple points that I want to make. Um, one, this is the complete code to define the network. So it's code concise. Two, broadly, the more layers you add to your network, and the more neurons or units per layer, the more capacity your network has, meaning the more types of patterns it can recognize. The problem is, the more things your network can recognize, the more likely it is to memorize the training data. So in machine learning, there's always this tension between memorization and generalization. You don't want to just memorize the training data. What you want to do is learn patterns that are useful to classify digits that you haven't seen before. So it's very easy to get very high accuracy on the training set by building a deep neural network with many neurons and training it for a long time. It's not necessarily the right thing to do, though. So when you're messing around with these architectures, start as simply as possible, and then slowly expand from there. The next thing you have to do is compile your network. This is the last step of building it. It's just one line. There's uh, two concepts. I'll get into the optimizer in a sec. Um, the loss function is basically the objective that your network is trying to optimize. The good news here is this is a fancy word, categorical cross-entropy. But what it literally means is your network is going to make a prediction. So you feed an image of a 2 through your network. And it gives you a probability distribution over all the digits that it could be. So maybe with 10% probability, it's a 0. With 5% probability, it's a 1. Hopefully, with like 90% probability, it's a 2. Anyway, this is a fancy word that compares the thing the network predicted to the thing you wanted it to predict. <laughs> And what you want it to predict is all the evidence is on it, too. The other thing is the optimizer. And this is the method with which you're going to train the network. The truth is, there's a whole bag of different optimizers you can use. You don't have to worry about what RMS prop means too much, because there are good defaults. So for this type of classification problem, basically, you're always using categorical cross-entropy. And RMS prop is a perfectly good optimizer to start with, using all the default parameters. So there's, there's good defaults. Broadly, the way the network is trained is using gradient descent. Um, so here's, here's how I would think about this. What a neural network is, when we add those dense layers, there are many different weights connecting uh, the pixels to the neurons. And you can think of all those weights as a parameter. So here's the simplest example that I had in my head. If you think of linear regression, so let's start with linear regression. You have some points on some plot and you're trying to find the best fit line. And if you think about, from high school, the equation for the best fit line, you've got like y equals mx plus b. And you've got two parameters that you're trying to learn. m is the slope, and you have uh, b is the intercept. And for different values of m and b, you can calculate how well your line fits the data, and you can look at your error. And there's different ways to get your error, but maybe it's the sum of the distance from your line to the pixels. So by adjusting m and b, you can find the best fit line. Neural networks are trained in a very same, in a similar way, except instead of M and B, you've got hundreds of thousands of parameters that you're trying to learn. And these parameters connect the pixels to the neurons and so on and so forth. And the way they're trained is using something called gradient descent. And there's a fancy diagram on the right that's showing something that's not relevant. Um, but uh, they all start at random values, and you slowly adjust them over time until the network becomes uh, better at recognizing digits. Anyway, um, I'll point you more educational resources in a sec. So um, here's the cool part. Building your model is where there are many, many machine learning concepts that you have to spend a lot of time learning. The next three steps, they're literally concepts that are basically involved with running an experiment. So there's, here's the only parameter. So here's how you train the model. So it's one line. Fit is synonymous with train. And we're training it using the training images and the training labels. Here's the only parameter that really matters. And the good news is this concept is a little bit simpler. So epochs basically means an epoch means one sweep over all the training data. 
So we have 60,000 images. One epoch basically means that we're training the network on all of those once. Training a network is a little bit like tuning a guitar. So think if you have a guitar and you want to, it starts untuned, and you want to tune the strings to hit a particular note. So you start tuning it, and like every time you twist the wheel on the guitar, you can think of that as an epoch. And you tune for a certain number of epochs until the guitar plays the right note. If you keep tuning past that point, it's no longer going to play the right note, and eventually the string is going to snap. So you have to stop tuning it at a certain point, and you stop tuning it based on the sound. Neural networks are exactly the same way. So there's basically one very simple plot, and it's this, which I'd recommend you look at while you're training your networks. On the y-axis, we're seeing this fancy thing called loss.、Uh, that basically means error. Loss is the same thing as error. It's just a fancy word for it. What we're trying to do is minimize our error. On the x-axis is how long we're tuning the network in terms of number of epochs. The longer, if you notice, after a few epochs, the loss reaches a low. That's kind of when the guitar hits the right note. If you keep training, the loss will start increasing again. So to find the right number of epochs, you literally make a plot like this. You just plot your error, and then you take a look at, you look for the point of lowest loss, usually in your validation data.、Uh, after that, you can evaluate it, and evaluate just means given some new data,、uh, classify it with my network, and take a look at the accuracy and other metrics. That's also just one line of code. And as called, this will give you、uh, your loss or your error and your accuracy. When you train the model, you can specify other metrics that you'd like returned. And then to make predictions on new data, it's also just one line of code. So there's some syntax here. So you can say model dot predict, and you give it an image. The syntax here is a little funny. As it happened, the model expects what's called a batch of data, and a batch just means it's it's meant to predict on multiple images at once. So you give it an image, and you just wrap it in a list. And this is just syntax to make it happy. But we're making predictions on the on on the very first image from the test data, and what the model gives you back is probabilities that that image corresponds to all the different digits. And basically, at the very lowest layer of the network, you'll have evidence sitting on all the output nodes. And、uh, if you do、uh, numpy dot argmax, so you just find the largest element, that will be the prediction. So here it's predicting that it's a seven.、Um, I'm going to give you a really quick overview of TF data, and then I'm going to hand it over to Lawrence、uh, to show us a little bit more about、uh, Eager. So, when I would, here's something to be aware of. In TensorFlow, there's many different ways of doing things. You should always do the simplest possible thing that's adequate for your problem. So never, basically, when you're starting with ML, and in probably 90% of settings, don't worry about performance. Just try and minimize complexity. So before we wrote our Hello World just using the、uh, MNIST data in NumPy format. That's fine. If we were working with a much larger data set, or if we were reading images off disk, or if we were pulling them from the cloud, there's a lot of complexity there, and performance starts to matter. For example,、um, there's latency when you pull images over a network. So maybe you'd want to hit a bunch of different servers at once, or maybe you'd want a bunch of different threads. So TF Data has all sorts of functionality to help you with things like this. Also, one funny thing that's happened: so GPUs and TPUs have become surprisingly fast. And the latency in training a lot of models is actually: can you keep the GPU fed? There's something called GPU starvation, where the、uh, matrix multiplier is so fast that it's just sitting around waiting for data. And so TF Data has lots of utilities to get your stuff, like prefetching it to the GPU if you need to. Anyway, what we're going to do here is Hello World. So we imported MNIST just from Keras, and just for demonstration purposes, I'm going to wrap it in a TF Data dataset. So I'm creating a dataset from Tensor Slices, which is a fancy word which basically Tells it that hey, this is a list of things, and I want every element in the list to be an item of my data set. The next thing you can do, it has this very nice、uh, clean API. I can say I also want you to shuffle the data. Here,、um, TF Data is designed to work with potentially very long lists of things, and it could be an infinite stream of data. You don't want to shuffle the whole stream, so shuffle has a size for the buffer. So here I have a buffer of a thousand elements, and I'm going to shuffle them as they stream in, and then I can batch it up. And、that means when I call this data set, I'm going to get back a batch of 32 things. And so now I want to show you very briefly、uh, how do you use it. So to use it, what you can do, and this is the complete code, by the way. You can just say, like for images and labels, print them out. So this looks obvious to me, and it's the way things should work. But if you're new to TensorFlow, it didn't used to always work this way. 
So if you have previous experience in TensorFlow, you can take a look and you notice nowhere in this code is there a session. There's no placeholders. I'm not mentioning the word graph. I'm just writing regular Python code, and the thing just works. So this is eager execution. Um, in TensorFlow 1.8 Plus, the only thing I have to do is the second line of code there. It's just I enable the thing. You need to do this at the start of the uh, Python file or notebook. And now you're basically running uh, TensorFlow eagerly, which um, if you're starting out, it's just regular Python. And this is the right way to use TensorFlow. It makes debugging much easier. Um, there's lots of reasons why you would use graphs, and we still love graphs. There's great talks from the TensorFlow Developer Summit that will go into them in lots of detail. But at least when you're hacking, definitely, definitely uh, do this. Um, OK, so for more context on all that, I've been talking for a while. Yep. Thanks for chilling. I'm going to hand it over hey, to thanks. Lawrence. Thanks, everybody. Uh, just a quick survey of the crowd. Uh, how many software developers here? I, we're at I.O., so we figured we'd have a few, so that's good. So uh, I've just been working on TensorFlow for a few months, and I think for getting started in TensorFlow can be a little bit difficult if you're coming from a software dev background, and getting started in any kind of ML can be a little bit tricky because there's so many new and different concepts. First of all, there's all the math, right? I mean, I didn't even understand this math when I was in high school, and now I have to understand it again. You know, people tell me about linear regressions, and my head explodes. Uh, but then. You know, it, it's learnable. It's something that you can pick up. But then secondly is really the programming model. And what, what is the programming model all about? And I come from a background of traditional programming. And in traditional programming, you basically you feed in the rules, you feed in the data, and you get answers out. So for example, if you're writing something like an activity detector, am I walking, am I running, am I biking, am I driving? You know, you'd feed in rules about that, probably something based around the speed. Right? I'm a very slow runner, so if it's detecting something going at one and a half miles an hour, you know, it's detecting me as running. But I know Josh is a really fast runner, and you know, so it would, uh, it, it, would, it would probably think he's on a bicycle if you're using my rules, those kind of things. You're feeding those data, you're feeding those rules in. And this is what we've been doing for years as programmers. But when it comes to machine learning, you've got to kind of flip the axis on this a little bit and change it to this. So when it comes to machine learning, this is all machine learning is. You feed in the answers, and you feed in the data, and you get back the rules. So when, you, when we talk about training a model, when we talk about like, building these models, what we're ending up getting is this binary blob that you can run inference on. And this binary blob that you run inference on has effectively got those rules that will, give them, you know, that will give what you need back out to you. So for example, in my uh, example of activity detection, you know, if I walk a lot and tell it that I'm walking and it's measuring my sensor data when I'm walking, and if I run a lot, which would be really nice, right? Uh, and if I run a lot and like, feed in the data, and if I bike a lot and drive a lot and go on trains and go on airplanes, you know, these kind of things, and feed in all this data and feed in the answers, telling it, OK, right now I'm walking, right now I'm biking, right now I'm on an airplane, then the idea behind machine learning is it will build that binary blob for me, which I can then run inference on. And by running inference on that, then it's like, OK, what am I doing right now? And it will deduce what I'm doing right now from all of these rules. And so instead of me trying to write all this if then, if then, if then, if then, you know, I train a system with data and with answers, and it gives me back rules. So let me give an example of this. Um, so what if we wanted to build something that would determine from a picture what's a cat and what's a dog? OK, now, if I was doing this with if-then rules, I could probably do something like, you know, if it loves you unconditionally, no matter what you do, it's probably a dog, right? And, and, and if it's right now plotting your murder, it's probably a cat. Uh, but right now, it's really hard to infer that from images. So it's, I, I couldn't think of what the if-then rules would be. Like Sometimes like, you might have an image say, well, if it's got pointy ears, it's a cat. But guess what? This dog has pointy ears. So you know, this, this is where we start thinking about, this is where machine learning starts opening up these new scenarios and these new ways that you as a programmer can bring value to your employers and to your business. So let's talk about the answers in this case. Okay? So the answers here is like, you know, this, is, this is a cat, right? You know, and uh, this is a, I think it's a dog, right? Okay, and this has got really pointy ears, this little guy, but this is clearly a cat. Uh, <laughs> this is a walking tongue, but it's also a dog. And uh, this one is what happens if you feed a mogwai after midnight, I think. Uh, but uh, this is actually one of the dogs in this set of cats and dogs. So like, you know, here, you know, I've got the data, and here I'm giving the answers. I'm telling the machine what all of these things are. So now, 
if I wanted to, as a programmer, all I have to do is train a neural network by giving it the answers. We call them labels and giving it the data. But as a programmer, here's where it was tough for me, and I've only very, very recently been on TensorFlow, because what is it? You know, first of all, I have to start working in Python. Any Python developers here? A few of you. It's a lovely language, but you tend to work in a text editor instead of an IDE, and things like step through debugging, because I came from a background of like Visual Studio and Xcode and Android Studio. So it was, it was a big learning curve for me to get into that. And then with, uh, if you started TensorFlow with graph-based execution, it was very strange, because you'd have all your code would like load up a graph, and then you'd execute that graph. And it's like, but what if I've got bugs in like reading my data, or if I'm not reading it properly, or if I haven't shuffled the data properly? And it's really important as Josh was mentioning earlier on, to shuffle your data properly, or you can insert a bias into your actual training. And I'm not a very good programmer, so I generally like to write two or three lines of code at a time, step through them, make sure they work, then write another two or three, step through them, make sure they work, and that kind of thing. And that was really difficult for me to do as a, as a TensorFlow developer. So if we can switch to the laptop, I want to show why I'm really excited about eager mode. And the screensaver kicked in. Sorry, I'm just signing in. So why I'm really excited about eager mode in TensorFlow is I've taken, and Josh has written a notebook with this cats versus dogs. So you can go and get this code online and run it in the notebook. But right now, I'm running it in PyCharm. Because like I said, I'm not a very good developer. So I want to write a few lines of code, execute them, write another few lines of code. And PyCharm, if you're not familiar with, there's a free community edition, which is what I'm running here. If you've used Android Studio, it probably looks very, very familiar. And what I can actually do is I can go in and I can say run debug. All right, and then I'm going to go, and I'm going to debug, and I'm going to debug cats versus dogs. And it's going to start executing. And look, I hit a breakpoint. You know, it's like this, this to me is magical as a developer. So now when, I'm, when I've hit my breakpoint, I can start stepping through my code and see what's going on in my code. So you know what? I'm going to, I've hit another breakpoint. I've set another breakpoint down here. So I'm going to execute my code down to that breakpoint. And now when I start stepping through this, I can start seeing that I'm doing things correctly. You know, like, OK, my data directory is set up properly, and I've defined my labels. And you know what? I'm going to put another break. I'll leave that breakpoint there. And I'll run down to this breakpoint. And I can start looking at what's going on in here. So I have my training images. And if I hover over that, you see it's like it's a little too big to print. But when I look at this in the debugger, I can now start seeing that. Look, I've started loading up these arrays of images. And I can see the image 0 here. Sorry if it's a little small. But image 0 here was cat number 921. And so if I then keep stepping through, and this is what eager execution is giving me. Whoops, sorry, I, I hit a break. I hit a break point I didn't want to hit. So I'm just going to go down to here and r continue running. All right, so, and if I then step over this, it should show me a cat. OK, so like, OK, I've gotten this cat. I'm loading it in. But is this the right cat? You know, have I written my code badly? Have I got the wrong cat? So I can go, hey, look, you know, here's my training data. I can go look at my cats. I can find cat number 921. And hopefully, it's the same cat, so I know my code is working right. You know, anybody else develop like this? You like to do it in little steps? Oh, good. It's not just me. Because <laughs> I, I find it really, really difficult to write a lot of code in one sitting. So I just got to do it baby step by baby step. And cat number 921 is here. And there it is. It's the same cat. So I'm like, excellent. I know my code is working. I know, I'm, I know I'm loading properly from my data. And I'll go through here. And I can see you know, my load image code. What it's doing is it's reading the image. It's creating a tensor out of that image. It's resizing it to like a smaller image that we're going to use in training. And when you come from a world where like the hello world in machine learning is handwriting recognition, you know, for me, hello world was S print F, hello world, you know, that there's, there's some very complicated scenarios and some very complex scenarios. But this breaks it down as a developer. And I can start poking through. I can start looking at data in the IDE. And I can understand really what's going on. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to execute, execute my code a little more. I'll and a really, a really cool point about this, too. So this load image function, if you look at it, it's using TF operations. So we're saying like yep. tensorflow.readimage. And these are working exactly like they would work if you were using NumPy. Because we're running eagerly, uh, this code is imperative, and it executes right after you hit the line. Also, you notice when Lawrence, which is really cool, hovered over it, and you could see the data. You can see the data, and not it's, it's concrete, not symbolic, because we're running eagerly. So. And, and of course, if you're uh, you know, in, in Python, you like to use the console as well. One of the nice things in PyCharm is that I've got a console window. So if my existing code is printing out to the console, I can do that. I'm just going to step a little bit further down. And I want to go just to the training. 
And one of the nice things that Josh was talking about is that this is just an iterator in Python. And, you know, I can now step through and I can take a look at what's going on in my training. I can look at this batch by batch. So if I've got 6,000 images that I'm loading in, I've split that into smaller batches. And then once I've done all of those batches, that's an epoch. So now I can just go through, and I can look at my actual epochs, and I can look at my training, and I can step into it, and I can Ooh. see what's going on as I this step This is great. Into Another quick point, too. To show you how fast these APIs are evolving, you'll notice that we're actually getting the NumPy value of the images and the labels. Yep. Uh, as of, I think, a few days ago, that's no longer necessary. <laughs> so you can fit Keras models using tf.data data sets. Uh, so you no longer need that intermediate step, which is great. But thank goodness it still works. Yes, it still works. <laughs> yes. And one of the really neat things about it, of course, is because TensorFlow is open source, if you want to know what's going on with your training, maybe something is going, maybe you've loaded data that's causing it to crash or something along those lines. As you're doing this and as you're executing these things, let's see if I can do it. You know, and I'm going to hit pause at some point, and I've now jumped into the TensorFlow source code. So not only can I step through my source to see what's going on, I can actually jump into the TensorFlow source. So maybe I've done something to trigger a bug in TensorFlow, or maybe I'm doing something wrong, and TensorFlow isn't handling it properly, and I can fix it, and then contribute back to TensorFlow. So all of this has been made possible by eager execution in, in, uh, in TensorFlow with Python. And as Josh mentioned, all you got to do is use TensorFlow version 1.7 or later and set up that executing eagerly. Uh, can we switch back to the slides now, please? Yeah, so cryptic error messages are mostly a thing of the past. So your third promise, Josh. Oh, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. I like PyCharm a lot. I spent a long time at Eclipse <laughs> before, yeah. Anyway, so uh, to learn more about these concepts, so I'm going to recommend two educational resources. So first is we have a machine learning crash course. It's pretty good. It's short. So this is probably maybe a day or two days of your time full time. This won't teach you all there is about ML, but it's a very solid, thoughtful introduction to what is loss, what is gradient descent. Next, I'd like to recommend a book, uh, which is by a Googler, and I'm going to badly mispronounce his name, but the author of Keras, Francois Cholet. It's a wonderful, wonderful book. It's called Deep Learning with Python. There are many, many books with very similar titles to Deep Learning with Python, but the one you want is written by Francois. It's published by Manning. And it comes with uh, a collection of Jupyter notebooks, which are all freely available on GitHub, by the way, that will basically teach you how to use Keras. Because Keras is part of TensorFlow, all of that code will work with no changes other than the imports directly in TensorFlow. And that will give you a really solid foundation in Keras. And then later, if you're interested, you can learn how to use things like TF data and other advanced features of TensorFlow to do even more. But it's a wonderful starting point. Um, so take away, oh. Another thing, too, so I wanted to also show TensorFlow.js in this, but we only have 40 minutes. With the Keras model, you can literally do model.save. It's one line of code. You'll say model.save and like foo.some path or whatever, foo.hd5. Now you've saved your model to disk. Using TensorFlow.js, if you go to js.tensorflow.org, they have tutorials that show you how to import relatively easily that saved Keras model into the browser. And so the same API is compatible across these platforms. So basically, uh, links. Check out Colab. Regardless of if you're using TensorFlow or not, Colab is a really, really valuable resource. It's also wonderful in educational contexts. You know, if you're teaching uh, after work or anything like that, students can just jump right in. Uh, check out the workshops. In the next three months or so, we're going to be updating a lot of our tutorials in TensorFlow.org to use Keras. But in the meantime, I'm just hacking some samples together so you can see what this looks like. Uh, TensorFlow.js, and we have an education. Website. And some really fun demos on js.tensorflow.org. Yes. Like, there's one where you can actually train it to recognize your face going left, right, up, and down, and then you play Pac-Man by going like this. It's, it's really cool. It's super yeah. cool. Yep. So take a look. And it's open sourced. Yeah. So thank you very much, everyone. I know it's early. We'll be around afterwards for as long as you want to take questions. I uh, really appreciate your time and hope this stuff is useful to you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.